So let's start by talking a little bit about your background and how your entrepreneurial business led up to the creation of Snail Games. The Ark Survival Evolved official servers are... What the fuck is that?! Fuck me! Fuck! This is bullshit! We'll say difficult. Ark is already a very die-heavy game with a steep learning curve, and that's on servers with Instatame. I can remember a little me booting up Ark on my second-hand Xbox and immediately logging on to the first PvP server I could find. I died. Again. And again. And again. But I wouldn't give up. I pushed, and I worked. I chatted with tribes on the server, I tried making alliances, I found a secluded area and even set up my wooden camp next to my level 5 parasaur. I really thought I could do it, and of course, I log on the next day, and my parasaur's entrails are splayed across the two splinters that remain from my camp. As it turns out, the fact that you're not a pro gamer may not be the only reason these servers can be borderline unplayable, or at least why they used to be. From a YouTube channel being created to specifically record the contemptible behavior of Snail Game's CEO, to the official servers allegedly being created to host real-world, profitable, all-powerful megatribes, this is the Snail Game's controversy. Hey, guess what? There's a raptor nearby. You see that? It's running right towards you. <laughs> <laughs> but, believe it or not, we're actually getting ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about the man behind Snail Games. An upstanding citizen of the world named Wang Shi Hai. There is actually very little on the internet about Shi Hai's early life out there, and what we do know is from his own mouth. He cites studying graphic design, having an interest in art, and an eventual career in advertising, before he and some friends would get together and eventually create the company Snail Games. They opened their doors in 2000, and after releasing their first game, Voyage Century in China, they were off. By the early 2010s, Snail Games had a pretty impressive amount of successful games under their belt, and they really wanted to cut into the American scene as well. Age of Wushu was the first transition they had their sights on. Age of Wushu is a free-to-play martial arts MMORPG that pulled from genuine and historical techniques. Critics voiced concerns that American audiences wouldn't understand the point of the game, let alone the culture or media behind it. Unfortunately, few of their games supported English, and as we know, the average American speaks about 0.5 languages as it is, so the likelihood of most of us finding these games interesting was low. Even though Wang was worried about this himself, he chose to release Age of Wushu to American audiences in 2012. After re-releasing games like Voyage Century Online, Heroes of Gaia, Age of Wushu, and more, Snail Games and Shi Hai seem to have struck a gold mine. Slowly, Snail Games was becoming a household name, one that you could grow to expect a triple A title from. Fan bases from around the world were already loyal to what Snail Games had rolled out so far. Shi Hai was so pleased with the success of his games that he even started making movements toward film and other digital medias. However, this bubble of success was about to pop, as in 2014, Snail Games was sued by their own former executive. Alright, so editor's note, there's actually very little information and few interviews online with Shi Hai. It was difficult for me to find a lot of them for this video, but I ended up finding this interview from Game Summit in 2022, and it's it's super interesting. So this is going to have to be a 1.5 real quick while I, while I squeeze this in here. So let's get into it. <gasps> 
So this interview was posted on the 27th of April in 2022. So I don't know how old Shihai is, but he is, I'll say not as sprightly as I, as I thought. All right, he gives a little more information in this to a little bit of his background. He says that his company moved to the US because of the gaming industry policies in China. They were a bit more restrictive. He makes some claims like Snail Games was the first ever company to engineer 3D gaming. He also relates leveling up in a video game to purchasing an NFT. Take that as you will. I'm gonna be fair, Shihai does express support for content creators that are supporting and enjoying his new platform. But to note, these feelings are expressed towards his NFT platform that he wants to release in a metaverse form. And as we all know, NFTs are renowned for their totally fair and non-predatory actions toward consumers. He mentions wanting to create a new metaverse like VR chat, where creators can mod and create and own their creations within the ARC universe. Apparently this metaverse will surround modders getting their own planet in the ARC solar system in which they can customize to their heart's content. He claims your NFTs will be stored on your planet where you can display thousands of dollars that you've spent on pixels. And listen, I'm, I'm gonna be fair, this sounds f***ing awesome. I would love to own my own ARC planet and be able to propagate it exactly how I'd like to. And yeah, I'd be willing to spend a lot of money on that. But honestly, that's probably just not gonna happen. And I'm also not gonna knock spending a bunch of money on video games. I grew up on League of Legends and at a certain point they made your gross purchases available to you. Within a six year span, I had spent just under $4,000. While this should hit you as a horror story, I was still spending money on pixels. The difference here was, other than actually selling an account with desirable cosmetics, which is largely a no-no in most games, you cannot trade and sell these items to other players once you've purchased them. Alright, so take Snow Bunny Nidalee. She was released for 520 riot points, which translates to around $5. This skin has returned over the years, but is generally touted as rare. I bought this skin years ago, and it's still sitting in my dusty, decaying, unused account. Now, Say League of Legends was an NFT platform. I now have license for this skin, and I'm able to sell it to anyone for any price if I so wish. And hey, people can do what they want with their money. If they want to buy these things, they can. I collect Tamagotchis. Like, but this type of gaming environment will inevitably lead to a very flawed in-game capitalistic economy. Developers can release NFTs for any price, and since it's literally an imaginary product, production and shipping are not as large of an issue as it would normally be for game development. And with these new NFT metaverse ventures being solely funded by their fictional product, they have every reason to release a Gucci box of chocolates with no chocolates in it. Rarity and availability for these items can be adjusted, which will inevitably lead to NFTs specifically related to separate video games, which consistently inflate until Snow Bunny Nidalee here goes from $5 to $5,000. And listen, I'm not an economist, I just have eyes. And I'm not trying to exaggerate here, some guy got murdered over a RuneScape sword in 2005. The entire project will be funded by the NFTs the game is created for. Frankly, this strikes me as a poorly veiled fake game built around non-existent collectibles. I don't know if you're familiar with Feral, but this reeks of that controversy. So what happened? Enter David Runyon, a man seasoned in video game development. He began work for Snail Games in 2012, shortly after their LA doors were opened. Since the incident, most records of David and his history before Snail Games are far too difficult to find, to a suspicious amount. But I digress. By this point, Shi Hai was definitely enjoying the spoils of his new market, and as much as reflected in his conduct with his employees. And while David's case is the first publicly recordable misconduct at Snail Games, I would definitely venture to guess it is not the first that occurred, given Wing's present conduct. 
While these realities of internal conflict were kept hidden for some time, they certainly were not new. According to Runyon, in October 2012, the company's director of publishing resigned after a clash with Shi Hai, leaving Runyon to take on those responsibilities in addition to his own. In December of the same year, Shi Hai terminated nearly all of Snail Games USA's marketing staff in a bid to move operations back to China. However, with a full marketing plan recently completed and the Age of Wushu's launch scheduled for March 2013, Shihai's actions, quote, threw the entire company into chaos. Grenyan was again asked to shoulder the extra responsibilities. In February 2013, the president of Snail Games USA resigned. The company lost four presidents in five years, meaning that Runyon was effectively in charge of the entire company, reporting directly to Shi Hai. He was given a promotion to director of game development and a pay increase. Wang's conduct and entitlement allegedly pushed nearly his entire staff out of future projects, all but Runyon, who was against his better interests, staying at the company until his eventual termination in 2013. This allegedly wrongful termination is what eventually pushed Runyon to open a lawsuit against his former employer. Beyond this, Runyon claims he experienced racial discrimination from Wang. Not even going to talk about that claim, however, this sentiment can be corroborated through other employees' description of discriminatory actions towards non-Chinese employees. Shi Hai made comments about preferring Chinese employees to non-Chinese employees, the document states. Shi Hai also made derogatory statements about American customs and culture. He goes on to state that his ideas and contributions were trashed in favor of other non-American suggestions. So obviously this part of the case is very politically muddy. Thankfully it isn't the focus of the lawsuit or this video. Runyon's main grievance, however, was the nature of his termination. Snail Games USA was in the process of moving to a larger office in July 2013, an event that Shi Hai had allegedly promised would be followed by Runyon's promotion to president of the company. However, while moving the boxes, Runyon injured his back and was later hospitalized due to the ensuing protruding disc. Due to the injury, he required 12 days off of work. Instead of leaving his desk completely empty, David opted to work remotely while he recovered. Keep in mind that this is 2014, so remote capabilities were different, but he claims medical documents were provided and that the situation was well communicated to Shihai and those surrounding him. However, in the beginning of August, David claims to have received two very hostile emails from Shi Hai, first accusing him of fabricating his physical problems, and the second informing him that he would not be returning to Snail Games USA. The document expands on David's claims with added identities and dates. Runyon and his team cite Shi Hai's treatment of David, his mistrust or disrespect, and cite specific situations that could tie his behavior to a more insidious racial ideology. Apparently, Shi Hai has a proficiency for dinner parties, specifically ones where he drinks a lot. The document itself is kind of funny, it's riddled with typos, uh, this statement is my favorite. By this time, Mr. Runyon had been given and MRI. The MRI results were not good. <laughs> and then David's team ends the statement with Mr. Runyon maintains that he was terminated because of his race, white, his uh, national origin, US, his ethnicity, Ameri- I, I don't- I don't know what happened in this case, I don't know what the outcome was, but honestly I don't really care if David got this amount of million on top of his other amount of million dollars, it doesn't really concern me. However, Shi Hai's actions do here, and I think it's a very clear pattern of behavior that he's putting forward, and I actually think this is a bit of foreshadowing um, to the current controversies that he is finding himself in. Alright, Kona Editeur again. There's actually a completely separate lawsuit that I forgot to mention. The gaming industry is basically high school at this point because on December 1st, 2021, Angela Games sued Snail Games for three things. A declaratory judgment of non-liability for copyright infringement, a declaratory judgment of non-liability for trade secret misappropriation, and violation of 17 U.S.C. 512F. 
That means all this bullshit. So pause the video if you'd like to read that. Okay, who the fuck is Angela Game and what did Snail Games do this time? Well, Angela Game is a fairly new and independently owned gaming startup from 2019, with, as far as I can tell, only two official game releases. They released their first game Iron Conflict in 2021 to a mixed and, to this day, small player base. Myth of Empires, no, not Age of Empires, their only other game, then releases later that year, in November 2021. The reception was far better, however, still small, but this time, it was because of very different reasons. To preface, I have a soft spot for the little guy. Angela Game is a story of a small developer leaving his corporate overlord to make it on his own and build something that mattered to him. However, the allegations of this case frame this developer of stealing code from Ark Survival Evolved and Studio Wildcard, his former employers, and implementing it into his own game as a shortcut. Shortly after the release of Myth of Empires, Snail Games sent a cease and desist letter to Angela Game through Valve, who promptly removed it from Steam. This obviously curtailed sales of the game. Angela Game then sends a temporary restraining order to Wildcard Games, which forced Snail Games to temporarily retract their DMCA takedown. I don't know, I honestly love seeing companies duke it out legally. It's like two farmers poking each other with their own cattle prods. In response, Wildcard then files two separate counterclaims, now raising these allegations to Tencent. Yes, that Tencent. As well as Angela Game. In Angela's haste to profit from its larcency, Angela also neglected to remove non-functional portions of Wildcard's code. Equally appalling, a Wildcard vendor who wrote unique code modules specifically for Ark Survival Evolved has told Wildcard that its same code modules appear in Angela's pirated game, Verbatim. The only place to find that code is in the Wildcard source code. In regard to claims against Tencent, the company that runs the servers Myth of Empires was hosted on, Wildcard claims that each time that Tencent runs the infringing game on a server, Tencent is publicly performing the game and creating yet another copy of the infringing game. On December 23, 2021, courts found evidence of a temporary restraining order against Wildcard to be insufficient, and denied the motion. Therefore, Wildcard's DMC claims were reinstated. If Angela Game wanted to get their game back up, they would need to go all the way to trial. And that's exactly what they chose to do. A neutral expert named Bob Ziedman was brought in to analyze the code of both games and determine whether the DMCA claims were legitimate. Finally, in October of 2022, his report was submitted. On the basis of his extensive comparison of the source code of Angela's game to Studio Wildcards, he concluded that Angela copied substantial portions of Studio Wildcards' copyrighted source code and tried to conceal its copying. Given that Ziedman himself is an extremely reputable source, it's fair to say that Snail Game's allegations are proven to be true. I mean, if the original evidence submitted by Wildcard is completely original, it appears Angela Game wasn't even trying to cover the fact they were stealing. However, at this point, things for Angela Game are looking grim. They are no longer working with their former attorney due to lack of funding, and their recent counteraction to reinstate Myth of Empires on Steam was denied by the judge. So there you go. A brief respite from his controversy. And a small win for legitimate copyright law. That was nice. After the lawsuit, Snail Games would step away from the spotlight for a while and focus on patching up their ouchies and changing Wang's diapers. In the meantime, preliminary development for a new MMO called Ark Survival Evolved had begun by a new studio called Wildcard. The game was originally released in early access on June 2nd, 2015 in the wake of the massively successful Jurassic World, intending to scoop up on that dino fever. The game was an instant hit, conceptualizing a multiplayer survival environment the likes of which the world has never seen. Everything that moved in the game could be tamed. You could tribe up with your friends and have your entire base destroyed in two minutes by a couple of slur-happy 12-year-olds. It truly was peak video game entertainment. During this time, Wildcard was actually facing a lawsuit of their own for unrelated reasons. In the wake of this chaos, Snail Games swooped in and covertly bought out the company. It wasn't even known publicly that Snail Games had acquired Wildcard until it was uncovered by a Reddit user in 2015, a few months after the actual deal. 
Now, whether Shihai was intending to buy out Wildcard before this point is unknown. However, it wouldn't be hard to deduce that regardless of the venture, Shihai needed a covert chance to further his stagnating company. In order to avoid criticism following his own legal battles, a secret change of ownership during a very public lawsuit between two large companies was the perfect veil Shihai had hoped for. And it worked. After Snail Games became the public owner of the ARC series, most of the public reception was optimistic, citing Snail Games' previous successful ventures. Even during this explosion of success for Snail Games, Shihai would remain relatively private in both his public life and in his role at Snail. So, time went on, and Ark Survival Evolved remained a relatively controversial less endeavor. But, of course, it was only a matter of time before someone would come forward with new allegations surrounding Wang Shihai, and no amount of gigas can defend one from real-world controversy. Official ARC PvP servers are multiplayer servers set up directly by Wildcard. These servers are intended for professional and hardcore players who want to experience the game in its true form. This means insanely strong dinos, minuscule XP harvests, and constant raid potential. Unless you are suited up with one of the established mega tribes across these servers, you will be very unlikely to survive more than a couple days before giving up. This experience obviously is not for the average gamer, <coughs> which is why the most popular servers offered to ARC players are player made. In fact, if you were to open a single player world and play on default stats, you would find it extremely difficult to get a substantial footing in the game without genuine hours of work. This generally isn't the issue for players, as historically ARC players aren't afraid of the grind. However, take the same experience and make it an official server and suddenly things become extremely organized. Because of the steep skill requirement to succeed in these spaces, players who do manage to gain a footing will inevitably fall under the influence of an established and powerful official tribe. There are a variety of official tribes to choose from, and if you think you have what it takes, you can even try to establish and run your own tribe. If you make it far enough, you'll come to realize there are two types of official tribes crawling these servers. One, the everyday Joe and his little community with a slightly higher interest in the game than most players. Two, groups of players I've come to refer as Mega Death Tribes. What sets these coagulations of pro arc players apart from the others is time and dedication. These servers are constantly running and have extremely low stats, meaning you are susceptible to having hundreds of hours of work swept away without you even looking away from Raid Shadow Ledge. The solution to this problem is numbers. Enough tribe members to have the base guarded 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Workers collecting resources, warriors, builders, and acting regular titan clashes as they constantly war for the top. These are the Megadeth tribes. Now this as a concept is bad enough, but what if I told you one or more of the most powerful groups of players in the game can be traced back to the man, the myth, the baby, Wang Shi Hai. In the years following the buyout, players noticed the slow change in competition on the official ARC servers. I myself played with a tribe before the official servers went to hell. It was time consuming and raging and unfair, but it was also time consuming and raging and unfair for everyone else on the servers. This baseline of difficulty kept players and tribes balanced, with monopolies being short lived as the average tribe didn't have access to necessary resources. But things were changing, and they were changing in the only way Shihai had found to be beneficial for him covertly. Now that Wang had control over ARC, he brought it to Eastern audiences, releasing it free to play for Chinese survivors. Slowly, the official servers were flooded with Chinese players regardless of region. Substantial tribes became monopolies, which became mega tribes. But why and how? Humans in general aren't exactly renowned for their ability to work together. That is one of the staples of the game. The fallibility of you and those who surround you. Generally, each person in a tribe is there to serve their own interests, as it is many times more difficult to traverse the game alone. This is why the power of the original tribes would shift so consistently. 
these servers were never meant to house a sort of independent government within the game. The ARC player base has long disdained official servers, doting them toxic and unfair, with many speculating the largest megatribes known to the community would employ inside men or employees of snail games or wildcard. Well, we'll come to learn that it's worse than we imagined. On January 1st, 2023, YouTuber Hod released a video detailing the present accusations against Snail Games' involvement with the official ARC servers. This spurs a Reddit megathread four days later concerning evidence and discussion of the servers. Then, Hod's video is hit with a privacy takedown by YouTube. This is allegedly due to the leaked DMs showcased along with audio messages sent from Shihai's phone. She doesn't want you to know about who he is behind the scenes, and he has now silenced at least one creator, who I might add has produced an entire channel mostly dedicated to appreciation of the game. And anytime he does put forth criticism, it seems to come from a place of genuine sadness for seeing Ark's steady decline in quality. Instead of showing you the videos themselves, I will be describing the context of the DMs and organizing them into a timeline of behavior, using none of the original footage. I'm a small YouTuber, so who could say Shihai is even gonna learn about this video, let alone take action against it? But if you do want to see what happens to me, make sure to subscribe and follow me on Twitter. <laughs> So at this point, Wildcard and Snail Games are being accused of at the very least breaking their own terms of conduct, manipulating official servers to benefit certain player groups, straight up gifting items and dinosaurs to these players and groups, and possibly more. So how do these server manipulations concern Shi Hai, the established MMO magnate? Well, we still have to discuss Wilfred Adventula. This mysterious figure created their channel on December 16th, 2021. For the next 10 days, Wilfred would go on to post 16 videos detailing, translating, and exposing certain Snail Games bigwigs for what is to us at this point unsurprising conduct. This channel appeared to fly under the radar for about a year before coming to light. As of this recording, this channel has 43 subscribers and just over 6,000 total views, so these conversations and claims are still mostly unseen. To that line, there will be a few different tribe names you'll hear throughout this, some of the bigger ones being A-Team, Bailey, CGI, and EE. Just know when I say these things, it's other large tribes. Something else to note is the tribe Shihai is allegedly known to be a part of is called TEA. This is the first recorded misconduct of Xi regarding the servers. On April 4th, 2017, Xi Hai's base is attacked, so he orders dozens of server rollbacks. May 13th, 2017, Xi's base is attacked again and again by CG Tribe. Xi orders Snail Games Operations Department to shut down the server. At the same time, he instructs wildcard employees to find CG tribe members and ban them. These messages are actually very tactful and serious. It makes me question why she is so invested in his tribe's success. She wants to attack Baili tribe and asks wildcard employees to spy on enemy tribe's servers, base locations, and to record weaknesses. On October 29th, 2017, she orders a full wipe of all CG buildings on multiple servers. He ends his demands with, my demand is clear. You do it right now. Set up call meetings if needed. You report to me in private for other matters. I need you to do it now. January 5th, 2018, she demands more items and supplies from Wildcard. January 6, 2018, she is preparing to attack an enemy base. He asks wildcard devs for a hack that would help him. He decides not to attack until the hack is ready. He requests cheat items instead. January 8, 2018, she requests intel on A-Team as well as more cheat items. January 8, 2018, he is annoyed that he is losing influence over official servers, so he tells his tribes that if they don't retake servers within 24 hours, they will all be fired. 
January 11th, 2018, suspicion is mounting around Xi's tribes. A-Team and Bai Li plan a raid as they suspect spawned items. A-Team's leader takes to a live stream and openly accuses TEA of cheating. They attack. Xi has all three tribes, including his own, banned to avoid suspicion and to protect his pride. Before the bans, he has wildcard employees transfer all of TEA's items to other servers. January 12, 2018, Xi's base is attacked again. He is unable to protect it, so he orders Wildcard to shut down server 165. He then bans opposing Bai Li and A-Team tribes. January 12, 2018, Xi's base is raided by A-Team, EE, and BLDX. He is not allowed to shut down the server as it would cause too much suspicion. He orders Snell Games employees to contact a DDoS service to do it for him. He's quoted asking an employee how much for one day. The employee responds, 60,000 RMB. He then replies, you pay it. Translated, that's $8,890.47. She she DDoSes the servers. Wildcard reaches out about the issue. She states he doesn't want anyone to know his involvement. She then goes on to specifically target players of the tribes that attacked him. He requests their home servers be DDoSed for one month, so that their dinos may starve off. He then states he has asked his guy to purchase 1 million yuan of data traffic TI clog servers, which comes to around $148,174. The Battle of 165 On February 5th, 2018, Shihai's base was attacked by multiple other tribes who were long fed up with TEA's obvious game manipulation. At the time of the attack, Shihai's tribe had fewer than 20 people online. Shihai resisted with hacks, and he cheated multiple items in, but he ultimately failed anyway. Multiple players who were there during the battle reported TEA on server 165. The news was spreading through the ARC community, and Shihai's true identity was nearing exposure. But he didn't care. He needed to maintain control of the official servers. TEA was subsequently banned in an attempt to avoid public discourse. This infuriated Shi. He goes on to threaten Jeremy Stieglitz, the producer of ARC saying he will wipe all Asian servers and take back all upper management positions. He then says he will fire him. The video ends listing the names of all tribes Shihai is known to possibly be associated with. Now, if you're confused, that's okay. So am I. What we are seeing is the blending of video game toxicity and workplace toxicity in a way that at least I have never seen. This man is literally threatening to fire the producer of ARK, the game he is playing, if he does not repeal the ban and rebuild his base. Imagine your boss is playing a game of tetherball with a middle schooler and he loses. Then he says, if you don't kick that kid in the teeth, you're fired. Obviously that example is ridiculous, but the situation Mr. Wang has found himself in feels like what would happen if an Xbox gamer grew up to own Fortnite. This video shows an instance on February 14, 2018, where he demanded wildcard employees spawn him items and dinos. He instructs the employees to prepare 500 tech dino frames, 300 tech ceilings, 600 tech walls, 100 tech doors, 300 tech foundations, 1,000 water mines, 5,000 C4, 200 RPG launchers, 2,000 RPGs, 10,000 fire arrows, 100 narco arrows, 3,000 ammo, 1,000 heavy turrets, 3 million bullets. He also asked them to prepare some basic resources along with armor, weapons, combat, accessories, and other things needed for war. He explains how he's not worried about anyone finding out about these millions of items, as they were procured artificially with no name. He also advises that outsiders not be allowed in the tribe. March 28th, 2018. She is once again attacked by A-Team and loses. A-Team server bans and wipes follow. His employee reminds Xi that the community is starting to notice TEA's strange relationship with Wildcard. April 19th, 2018. This is the big one. Because she consistently failed to defeat A-Team, he began to suspect that they too had an inside man. He then instructs a Snail Games employee to forge a fake chat screenshot involving Wildcard co-founder Jeremy Stieglitz, framing Jeremy as the leader of A-Team. He blames Jeremy for the DDoSing, the outages, the spawned items, saying that he is the leader behind the scenes. Basically, he accuses Jeremy of being 
himself. He then has the screenshot spread to Reddit. Throughout these videos, it is clear that at some point between purchasing Wildcard and publicly announcing its involvement, Shihai took a liking to the game, and specifically the power and control he derived from running the TEA tribe on ARK's official servers. In my opinion, the most damning aspect of this entire video series is Shi's attempt to forge a controversy against Jeremy Stieglitz. And suing controversies forced Snail Games employees off of official ARK servers including she. Snail Games would then release ARC Classic servers, their own version of ARC Official, except this time she can run rampant in his true form, with no one standing between him and the player base. According to player reports, this conduct is as present if not worse than it was on official servers. But wait, I hear you say, weren't there 16 videos? Yes my dear, there was a 16th video and it only cements the public's current view of Xi. It exposes Xi Hai's marriage to Zhao Ying, who works for SDE Inc., which is the parent company to both Wildcard and Snail Games. Fans of the game speculate this is why Xi has seen such success through his Wildcard venture, and why his childish online conduct continues to go unchecked by any of the three companies. Throughout his entire career, Xi Hai has used the power he had to manipulate and belittle those under him. His obvious, uncapped sense of pride takes full flight when she plays video games, because it can't in his real life. He can demand in-game items from his employees and threaten to fire them if his base gets overrun, but it's just a matter of time before someone like Runyon takes him back to court. Hell, Jeremy has a huge case as it is. The sad reality of this situation is that ARK Survival Evolved is currently produced by a greedy, soulless corporation run by a man with similar traits, and while this is definitely not abnormal to the average corporation, she decides to actively participate with the community that surrounds him. And he doesn't come as a friend, he comes as a god. And if you dare defy his image, you will be banned from an Ark Survival Evolved, the video game, uh, server, hmm, <laughs> um, anyway, Ark is still fun, I guess? From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching the whole video. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this before. If you liked this video even a little bit, trust me, I've got better coming, so subscribe and follow me. <laughs> If you want to see more of me, I stream every day at 7pm Mountain Standard Time. Alright, stay strong, my friend.